Tokenmetrics is a cryptocurrency investment platform that helps users leverage machine learning to become better crypto investors. Our in-depth analysis helps eliminate the emotions of investing, find profitable investment opportunities, and filters out scams. Learn more at tokenmetrics.com. Disclaimer. Tokenmetrics Media LLC does not provide individually tailored investment advice and does not take a subscriber's or anyone's personal circumstance into consideration when discussing investments, nor is it registered as an investment advisor or broker-dealer in any jurisdiction. Information contained herein is not an offer or solicitation to buy, hold, or sell any security. The Tokenmetrics team has advised and invested in many blockchain companies. A complete list of their advisory roles and current holdings can be viewed here at tokenmetrics.com slash disclosures. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The 100X Show. I'm Ian, I'm Ian Bellina, your host. And today, we have the pleasure of being joined by Jeremy Gartner. Jeremy, how are you? I'm doing well, man. How are you? Great, great. Fantastic. So I had the pleasure of uh, talking to you down in Miami. And how are things in uh, Miami for you? Miami... To be perfectly honest, it's a bit too good. I very impulsively last week after speaking to my business partner actually decided to move to LA because I was enjoying life just a bit too much. And I, I, and I mean that in the best way. I, I, I love living here. It's actually a great place to work, but there's not a great business startup community. And, you know, when you're in your 20s, you know, it's, it's nice being comfortable, at least for a little while. I'd consider mm -hmm. the past year and a half living here kind of a sabbatical while I launch my new company. But as I think about building and scaling a business, it's really not the place that I want to be. And so uh, I think I'll definitely come back here in the future. It's my favorite place I've ever lived. But for now, yeah. taking my talents to Los Angeles. Nice move, nice move. I mean, as somebody who was down in Miami last year for almost four months, I definitely also have the same same thought process as you. I think going to LA, LA is a great crypto city, also a great investing city. So yeah, good move. I mean, and only getting better. I mean, it's burgeoning. So I'm very excited for the move, despite my slight aversion to Los Angeles based yeah. on those previous ex experiences. All right. So let, let's take a step back. For those people who may not know you, who is Jeremy Gartner? Oh. Uh, just, just a pretty normal dude. Uh, not uh, any sort of savant. We can say that for sure. Uh, grew up in a small town in Massachusetts. Was a juvenile delinquent. Got in lots of trouble. Uh, knew from a young age I wanted to have a positive large impact on the world but was never really sure how. St started by going to Occupy Wall Street when I was in college. I went to a school two hours north of Manhattan. Uh, went to protest uh, the big banks uh, after seeing what they did in the wake of the Great Recession. Was very disillusioned by the movement being unable to really issue demands, actionable demands, and thus didn't see much come of what happened in Zuccotti Park. You know, it probably may pave the way for folks like Elizabeth Sanders, uh, Elizabeth Warren, and Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. But but in terms of the ability to affect the financial system, which we were protesting, it accomplished virtually nothing. And so then I thought maybe I'd go into politics. And so I ended up working for the governor of Massachusetts, then the woman who's now attorney general. And those experience demonstrated that in my 20s, all I was going to do is push paper and raise money for politicians. And I really got to experience a broken bureaucracy in the political system. And so I knew that there was really no way I was going to do that. Had this period of cognitive dissonance and then ended up moving, uh, transferring to the University of Michigan my junior year of college and happened to move in with a young Bitcoin enthusiast who sent me down that rabbit hole. And then ever since, mm -hmm. I started a global educational nonprofit, um, Augur, one of the very decentralized applications, first ICO on Ethereum, first utility token, then joined Blockchain Capital, as an entrepreneur in residence. While there, I started a magazine, Distributed, which is a 108-page primer on blockchain technology, another software company called Sava. And then in late 2017, early 2018, I launched my own uh, venture fund focused on the intersection of blockchain technology and social impact called Awesome Ventures. 
Wow. I mean, you've done so much and you're still in your 20s, I believe, right? Yes, just turned 28. Wow. Okay, so let's kind of go through each of those parts. So the first part that really jumps out at me. So you moved to Michigan yeah. and your roommate is a Bitcoin enthusiast. He actually wasn't even our roommate. He was actually just sleeping on our couch. He had been part of the fraternity of the guys who actually were renting the apartment. He had dropped out to start one of the very first Bitcoin exchanges in the US, a US uh, Bitbox. His name's Kennard Hockenhall. And he had this really interesting story. He was from the inner city of Detroit. His house had had their family foreclosed upon in the Great Recession. He had become an anarchist, discovered Bitcoin in like 2011, 2012, started one of the first exchanges, uh, joined Plug and Play Accelerator. No, he joined uh, Boost VC and, mm -hmm. and in their very first class, uh, started before Coinbase actually, uh, but ended up getting defrauded through a bad wire and had to move back to Michigan and was sleeping on her couch. And wow. he convinced me to explore Bitcoin more ser seriously. I had heard about it in 2011 due to the Silk Road. And then I had bought a bit uh, that fall in 2013, sold when it hit a thousand dollars. I was like, this is just some crazy <laughs> pump and dump. And then that winter in, in early 2014, he convinced me to ex examine the technology more meaningfully. Okay. I mean, so was it an easy sell for you if, since you just came from being part of Occupy Wall Street or what, did it well, take some time as well for you to really believe in it? It was due to my disillusionment with Occupy Wall Street and with the political system that made me incredibly enthusiastic about Bitcoin once I began to actually understand the technology. Uh, as much as at that time, the industry was almost entirely occupied by anarchists, and libertarians and anarcho-capitalists. As someone that was incredibly progressive, even liberal, it actually made just as much sense to me because I wasn't, I, I don't consider myself liberal or progressive because I like a big government. Um, I, I, I like it because it, it, it tends to have a more idealistic view of the world. And I actually, as I've developed since, become much more libertarian because I believe in social freedoms but what I really didn't like was the banks. And Bitcoin allowed you to be your own bank. And it allowed people to have more autonomy in a growingly online world. And so I got very excited for, due to my progressive values, not in spite of them. Okay, very interesting. So you kind of go down this rabbit hole of Bitcoin and crypto. Now, how do you get into Augur? How does that come about in terms of building the first Ethereum token? Uh, so uh, it, it was a, a kind of a funny path. So very briefly to get to Augur, you have to understand that uh, Kennard convinced me to join the University of Michigan Bitcoin Club. At the very mm -hmm. first Bitcoin Club meetup, I learned there were Bitcoin clubs at MIT and Stanford from a journalist that was uh, writing an article about university Bitcoin enthusiasts. And so I asked to be put in touch with them, got on a call with the heads of those clubs that same night. Uh, and they're all talking about their respective successes and failures as organizations, offering to share resources. I don't have much to contribute because it's my first Bitcoin Club meetup. But mm -hmm. at the end of the call, I suggest, hey, why don't we create an organization out of this? Uh, the politician in me saw this opportunity. Everyone was like, sure, go ahead. And I incorporated what is now known as the Blockchain Education Network. We went online to raise awareness for this organization, telling any Bitcoin clubs that existed or any young person that wanted to create a Bitcoin club to reach out to us and they could join uh, our network and share our resources. And within three months, we had over 100 chapters in 20 plus countries on every habitable continent. And it was through wow. this nonprofit I had founded that I met Joey Krug, who is this brilliant 18 year old computer scientist at Pomona. And we ended up really having chemistry, deciding to start a, a point of sale startup together uh, and spent the summer in Michigan and, and Illinois, where he was from, working on this startup. It started to get interest from investors. We were going to a few conferences. I was speaking at conferences already around the world due to the nonprofit that I had started. And it seemed like it had a, a bunch of potential. To make a long story short, we ended up dropping out of school, moving to California, uh, 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 teaming up with another startup, 
and then stumbled upon this white paper truth coin for a decentralized prediction market platform and decided to go implement it. Uh, we just first decided to build on Bitcoin, writing a white paper on how to implement a prediction market system on top of Bitcoin, but really very quickly realized the UTXO system of Bitcoin wouldn't enable a decentralized application by, like Augur. Fortunately, I had met Vitalik uh, on the conference circuit. We were the only young guy speaking at these conferences, and he was really in prediction market, so I'd already been an advisor uh, to Augur. Uh, when we were having all these issues and he was like, look, Ethereum was made for something like this. Mind you, Ethereum was at least nine months away from even launching, but mm -hmm. he was like, you should try building on this. And being the naive entrepreneurs that we were, we were like, sure, <laughs> let's try it. <laughs> and, and so we ended up uh, building pretty much what was probably the first startup on top of uh, Ethereum and you know, quickly realizing in this process, we probably actually realized this before that we would have to issue our own novel token, not for our own blockchain, but to create a decentralized consens a consensus system, which was Augur's rep token. This would be the first utility token ever created. Um, and in my view, still probably the best. I, 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 I still carry with me a degree of guilt uh, for having spawns uh, as, as such a creation because it was just it led to a Pandora's box of crap coins that we uh -huh. would see in uh, the ICO fervor and and the following years. Yeah. Okay. So very interesting story. Now, what made you take the leap of faith to drop out of school to go all in? You know. It was this funny thing. I had I'd been like absorbed in the world of Bitcoin and blockchain technology for about nine months at that point. We had this opportunity with our startup, which obviously evolved into something totally different within a month or two. But I had this overwhelming sense, and this is what I told my parents when I decided to drop out, was that if I didn't drop out of school and pursue this technology, because uh this the Michigan had met, made up a, a huge mess up with my transcript when I transferred. And, and I was under the impression that I was going to be able to spend the next two semesters before I graduated, taking one class each semester and working on my senior thesis. Turned out I had like a 26 credit shortfall. So either I had to choose between my startup and my nonprofit versus mm -hmm. school. There was no way I could do both. And what I told my parents was, is like, all this is going incredibly well. I can always go back to school. But even if Bitcoin today only has a 5 or 10% chance of succeeding, which was probably the likelihood back then. Most people said Bitcoin was dead. It had just collapsed like 80 or 90%. Um, but if I didn't go and take that leap of faith, I'd regret it for the rest of my life. And looking back now, God, is that true? I mean, just imagine yeah. those like, major mistakes people make in their life and they're just filled with remorse that would have absolutely been one of them. There was, it, was, it was such a critical life decision that I made and, and, and seeing the success that Bitcoin has had and blockchain technology has had, the relative success of the organizations I founded, uh, there couldn't have been a worse decision than staying in school. Of course, I didn't know that at the time, but even a five to 10% probability was enough of a probability to go and take that risk. Wow, okay. I think that definitely does make sense. Now, so you meet Vitalik, he tells you to start building on Ethereum. What was it like back then? I mean, was Ethereum this pipe dream or did everybody back then think Ethereum would actually become what it is today? No, so it's so funny. So around the time that we decided to switch over to Ethereum, um, the sidechain white paper came out and Blockstream came out. And, you know, virtually everyone in the Bitcoin community in San Francisco, there was no Ethereum community in San Francisco back then, um, said that Ethereum was a scam and it was vaporware and anyone involved was going to go to jail. And then, of course, sidechains come out and everyone's like, oh, you could just build on a sidechain. Thank God we didn't listen to them because <laughs> <laughs> that really never became a thing. But no, I mean, no, everyone that was initially thrilled with Augur, like all the Bitcoiners were sharing our original white paper because it was, it was written about how to build on top of Bitcoin. 
turn their backs on us. Now, fortunately, I had built a, a, enough rapport with most of the big Bitcoiners in the industry at that point, having done my nonprofit and spoken at conferences and been involved in the San Francisco community, that uh, you, I didn't experience the animosity that now exists between different blockchains. But it was certainly people telling us that we're idiots and that we're building on vaporware and that Ethereum's never going to launch. And so it was not an easy decision. But at the time, it seemed like the only choice we had built on the needs of the application that we were building. Okay. Now, how is Augur doing now? So I believe both of you and Joey have left the company to pursue other ventures. Yeah, so Joey's still heavily involved. He's in very much from uh, like technological and architectural standpoint, Joey is very much uh, a force behind what's being built. Uh, me much less so. I, I'd call myself a, an informal ambassador. You know, I still help the team where I can if they need something. I still get sued if Augur gets sued for some reason. <laughs> but, 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 but generally speaking, uh, you know, I'm much less involved. But Augur is something that I think you can find talks I gave in 2015 saying that if Augur is successful, you won't see mainstream adoption until 2021, 2022, simply because we were aware even back then how many technological developments would be necessary um, in the blockchain ecosystem on Ethereum with stable coin technology, um, with scalability and speed. All those things needed to happen before we could ever imagine a, a Augur being like a widely adopted application. It was just too fringe. Uh, prediction markets are not well adopted enough, even in a centralized manner, for you know it to have much hope in the near future. But if you look at if you looked at Augur's development over the past four years, it is it's consistently been one of the ten most active GitHub repos across the entire crypto economy. Uh, mm -hmm. Technology progressively gets better. Doesn't have a lot of users, not many at all right now. But Augur 2.0 is, is about to come out. Um, and then Ethereum uh, 2.0 will make Augur a thousand times a, a faster, more efficient. And then, uh, and then stable coins will soon be implemented on Augur as well, which make at long-term bets far more palatable than if you're making a, a bet six months from now with Ether which is which is uh just uh far too volatile you know you're when you make right. a bet like that you're now betting on not only on what you think is going to happen in the future but also on the the volatility of ether and so that doesn't really work so there's still a lot that has to happen but the development of augur has been fabulous a lot of people that are that understand the development of this ecosystem are making big bets on it i haven't sold a single one of my tokens I'm still, I'm still. A wow. Uh, well, and why is that? Uh, because, well, one, it would feel disingenuous to profit from something that I helped create. And I've been saying it's going to change the world or it's going to be successful. And it hasn't yet. You know, it hasn't been broadly adopted. It hasn't been successful. You know, I've managed to, you know, since 2014, 2015, I put every penny I've made into the, the into crypto assets or, or into startups. And so I've been able to make money elsewhere without compromising on my conviction in Augur. Would I have made a lot more money if I had sold a, a good chunk of my tokens and uh, invested elsewhere into things, into assets and investments I knew would appreciate quicker? Absolutely, but I've never built startups or invested in startups or even crypto assets purely uh, out of the desire to make money. I, I really have a strong conviction that it's possible to both invest in startups and assets and, and do it within belief that those investments are going to make the world better in some way. And so uh, I, I, I really try not to compromise. I, 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 you know, short-term profits are not as nearly interesting to me as having a long, a, a, a big time impact and making money over the long term. Uh, obviously, working in crypto has enabled me to do both. 
but I really tried to be um, as moral as possible in my investing, even though many people will tell you there's no, that there is no morality in investing. If that makes any yeah. sense. <laughs> well said, well said. Okay, so was all this happening in San Francisco at the time? Yeah, I mean, I, so I was flying around the world. That was my big role. I was Augur's ambassador before the ICO. I was flying around wearing, uh, raising awareness. I was getting speaking gigs because of my nonprofit. And I was able to turn that into speaking gigs for Augur. And uh, I, my, I was the chief evangelist, you know, oversaw mm -hmm. all operations and business development. But really, uh, I, was, I was going and, and doing podcasts and, and, and dealing with journalists and just trying to make people get excited about a decentralized prediction market built on Ethereum, which meant absolutely nothing to absolutely everyone. I mean, as I, it's, you have to understand, saying that before Ethereum even launched, just did not register. To, it maybe registered to like Vitalik and 20 other people. Everyone else, you really had to educate. What's the prediction market? What's decentralization? What's Ethereum? Uh, it, was, it, it was a lot. I, and figuring out how to perfect that pitch took a long time. Now... Did this also happen at, at the time when you were staying at the Crypto Castle in San yeah, Francisco? So that, I mean, Augur's the reason why the Crypto Castle was born. Uh, we, we started our life in LA, not really Augur, but that those in, initial merging of startups. And then we moved out to San Francisco in the fall of 2014. And we didn't have any money. And so we ended up getting this dingy, two bedroom apartment for six people that I jokingly called the Bitcoin basement. Uh, <laughs> and a couple of months later, once we raised a bit of money, uh, I found us this three bedroom home overlooking uh, San Francisco that in relation to the basement felt like a castle. So I very jokingly called it the crypto castle, ended up turning it into seven bedro bedrooms. If you've ever been there, you know, it's not really a castle, although the view is definitely inspiring. And that's really how the Crypto Castle was born. Nice. So what did you do after, after Augur? What was next? So after Augur, I joined Blockchain Capital as an entrepreneur in residence. I was really supposed to just think about my next startup, but I ended up bringing in so many deals to them that they ended up giving me carry on their second fund uh, because I, I, I was bringing in fairly impressive entrepreneurs that we invested in. And I uh, then, in addition to really becoming an investor on the team, I started this magazine distributed. Uh, and then I started a legacy database security company called Sava. So back to blockchain capital, what was yeah. your system or process of finding good entrepreneurs? It's, you know, as, as a venture capitalist and fairly prolific angel investor. Now I think, you know, between the venture funds and my angel investments, I've invested in over a hundred startups. Um, you know, m more often than it's not, it's, it's a matter of spray and pray. You kind of just like, you know, <laughs> unless, right. uh, uh, but, but then my, my, my view evolved, especially at blockchain capital. Um, actually, I guess I was investing with them before I became an angel investor because I didn't have money when I first joined them. Um, it was, you know, it was all about the entrepreneurs, you know, we were then and I am now typically the first institutional money into a startup. And so it was really getting a feel for the entrepreneur, getting a sense of, you know, what their pitch was, but knowing that, you know, startups evolve. And so what was so important was just getting a good feel for the people that I was potentially going to invest in. And that remains true to this day. The, the founders are everything. You know, there are exceptions to that rule, but generally speaking, when, you, when you're really early in the life cycle of a company, the, the founders and the team mat matter more than anything. And uh, that, that was the system I developed. Now, we would evaluate the potential markets, the business model, but I, I, you know, I am more a gut investor than my LPs would probably care to admit, you know? <laughs> right. Okay, cool. So, okay, so after that, then you moved on to Sava, you said? Which no, so, was... while, so I, while I was at Blockchain Capital, 
I started the magazine and then this uh, uh, software company called Saba. Okay. Now, what was the reason for creating that? Just something you wanted to, to make or solve a problem? Yeah. So, so by 2016, 2017, I had a bit of money. Bitcoin had gone way up. Uh, I had put all my money into Bitcoin. Augur, uh, Augur had been listed. Uh, and so I felt like wealthy, even though I wasn't really mm-hmm. that wealthy. I, you know, I was wealthy enough to feel like I had the capital to do new things. And uh, I was the entrepreneur in residence at Blockchain Capital. So in theory, you go and start companies. Sava was an interesting one in that uh, I was a judge at a hackathon. These guys created a system to make um, the VA appointment booking system more efficient. I was like, this is brilliant. You could create a government, get a government contract from this. And kind of stupidly, I took a hackathon team and I was like, here's a check, go start this company. <laughs> and, and I was, came on as a co-founder, but then the company's gone through a bunch of changes then, learned a lot through that experience. Um, but it was, just, it was just a fun idea. Like when, when I see great ideas, I typically either want to invest in them or go and build them. And so th- th- that's what happened there. Uh, d- Distributed was a magazine that the folks over at BTC Media who and why Bitcoin and Bitcoin Magazine wanted to build. Uh, they were really Bitcoin guys. I was a blockchain guy. They're like, do you want to come in as the founding editor for this magazine? It's like, sure, I, I'll spend two months, three months in Nashville, create this magazine. And it was, uh, it was a really fun, creative process. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I do most things on a whim, and that, those were definitely both uh, some of them. Yeah, I mean, you, you definitely seem like a free spirit. <laughs> yeah, I think most people would agree with that uh, analysis of me. Okay, so then fast forward, what did you do after that? After that, I uh, it will you kind of creep into 2017. I start to become really alarmed with the whole ecosystem, all the ICOs. But I invested in several of the early ICOs, uh, helped a lot of those teams. But, you know, my money was still all in crypto. And by late 2017, I had a a substantial net worth. Like, Uh like, like, imagine if you invest all all the money you have, even if it's a small amount in like Bitcoin and Ether and XRP in mid-2015. You know, I I mean, I I invested in XRP at like 0.00 three cents and you know uh-huh. i sold at like 330 only time i ever sold crypto. 100x <laughs> no no a thousand x a thousand x oh uh, wow yeah, huh? yeah, yeah, yeah. that was that, that and so wow. that, that, that's probably the best uh investment i'll ever have made you know I wow put, like, yeah that is huge a thousand x i had put like less than two percent of my crypto portfolio into xrp a couple years prior now it was up over over a thousand x and so it, uh, it was a really uh, remarkable time, but I was also really alarmed. Uh, I gave a speech at BTC Miami around then saying, this is just horrible. It's insane. It's, uh, you know, there was so much crap. There were so many scams. And to me, I had a tremendous amount of cognitive dissonance. You know, I had spent the past three years evangelizing how Bitcoin and blockchain technology were going to go and make the world better. And yet here I was a multi multi millionaire and this technology had done no such thing. In fact, you know, what was making me wealthy were all these scams and all this garbage um, that existed. And I felt terrible. It's like I, I called the top in January, 2018 at the mm-hmm. BTC Miami conference, but I, I couldn't bring myself to sell all my crypto despite wanting to, because I felt like, you know, there were all these stories about me that like people were getting inspired to invest in crypto uh, into by, even though I was appalled by the stories, I just felt like I was part of the problem and selling would once again, just be the, an immoral thing to do. So instead I took the money that I had made and I went out and decided to launch a hybrid venture hedge fund focused on this intersection of crypto and social impact so I could actually see the companies that I believed would make the world better 
and you know I went out it wasn't easy to fundraise uh fortunately I didn't <laughs> really have to but it wasn't easy to fundraise because I told all my LPs like look I think this is all going to crash and we, we're going to have some money in crypto but you know if you look at the seven year time horizon of this fund it's it, it, it's going to have really good returns and I, I feel that way to this day but it was definitely not uh, you know, I was a bit too transparent with the potential investors in my fund simply because I, I, I knew that it was unsustainable at that point in time and surely it crashed and now we're doing fine. But uh, it was uh, a very unique time in the history yeah. of uh, industry. Uh, uh, quick questions. What price was Bitcoin at when you got in? Well, so I first learned about it when it was like $10. Uh, I first bought it in... October, I want to say, uh, 2014. So it was, I want to say 200, $250. And then I sold at a thousand. And then when I got back in, um, after the auger ICO, after I got my back pay from that job and, and, and took all the money that I had, that was mid 2015. So, uh, I think Bitcoin was back around 250, $300. Um, ETH, ETH when I bought it was, I want to say eighty cents, ninety cents, and wow. like XRP was like point zero zero three, point zero zero two cents. I mean, great timing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a little did I know. I mean, uh, I, 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 you know, I don't. I've never been one to speculate on the future price, but I, mm -hmm. I would have never guessed what would have happened. Happened and. Uh, you know, I, I, I invested because I was so convinced in the long-term future. I didn't right. like, I wasn't really interested in getting rich in the next two years of my life. I was very interested in putting my money in this technology that I thought was going to change the world and would appreciate exponentially over the next decade or two. It just happened to happen much faster than I expected. All right. So tell us more about Awesome Ventures. So it's a social impact fund. Yeah, so I take a very broad view of social impact. I'm just not going to invest in startups that like improve clearing and settlement for Goldman Sachs or make, uh, make I don't know, ExxonMobil supply chain more efficient. You know, I'm mm -hmm. looking for entrepreneurs that have the conviction that what they're doing, it actually provides some improvement to the world. And what makes me a lot different than, you know, a traditional social impact fund is that I'll go and invest, I'd, I'd call something like Uber or Lyft, social impact startups, or well, they're not startups anymore. But I, I would have called them that because they're improving like urban mobility and solving last mile problems for a lot of commuters and, and, and so on and so forth. It, you know, I take a very broad view, but I have to be able to articulate to myself, because I'm the main LP in my fund, but I have to convince myself and, and, and convince my team, uh, because I have a team under me, uh, in my investment committee that this technology or this startup is, is somehow going to make the world better. And, uh, you know, it limits us in some ways, but I think it attracts all the right sorts of founders. Mm -hmm. I'd say in the past two years that we've been around, we haven't missed any like great deals at that intersection, which isn't a, a huge Venn diagram of impact and blockchain. But it's big enough that I feel like our mission really resonates with the sorts of founders that we want to invest in. And the fact is, is that if you do invest in a startup that has a huge social impact, uh, then there's no way it's not going to make a lot of money if you're the first investor in the company. You know, uh, uh, you know as long as the economics aren't totally messed up, uh, you know, any company that has a, a tremendous social impact in the world um, is going to make a lot of money as well. Uh, so that was our thesis going out to pitch, when we're pitching LPs and allowed me to feel better about the wealth I generated. I mean, I'll, I'll be frank, a lot of what I did was due to the fact that I didn't feel good about the money I made so far. Okay. Now, so online, there have been reports by different media publications that you basically have hundreds of millions of dollars. Are you able to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, not anything credible. It's just if you Google Jeremy Gardner, the first result is net worth. And then it says like, like Google tells you I'm worth like $900 million. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea what happened. So I, I do have a suspicion. So 
you often see 300 million. And that's mm-hmm. because I went on a Ty Lopez's uh, show and he said, Jeremy got a gardener to the $300 million founder of Augur. And that's because one is Ty Lopez, but two, <laughs> that was the market cap of rep at the time, Augur's mm-hmm. token. So he was talking about the market cap of the startup I had founded. And then that somehow became got, your net worth. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then, and then if you look at any of the, if you look at any of the stories that state my net worth, um, mm-hmm. they're, they typically look like they're written by bots, like, or by like, russians like for like mm-hmm. click farm websites um one I, w- I would never discuss my net worth I, I i've made a good deal of money but nothing like that yeah uh, not not nine figures um and importantly to me you know what's been very hard for me is that you know often in the press like i get it's like jeremy gardner bitcoin millionaire or something like that first of all I didn't make my millions on Bitcoin. I made a little bit of my money from Bitcoin, but it's from all my other investments and from the startups I've invested in. And secondly, I would never want to be identified by my wealth. Like, yes, I know it makes me different than I'm 20 something years old and I've made millions of dollars, but that's not interesting to me. And it's never the reason why I've done what I've done. So a huge source of uh, consternation for me, definitely not worth hundreds of millions, but you know, I, I, at the same time have made a humbling amount and you know my only hope is that i can take that money and use it to do good in the world because if not it's not interesting to me i'd rather be broke and helping people than ultra wealthy and not well said well said okay so tell us about made man and by the way there is no relationship with diary of a made man (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. You, you've got the name. Well, I got the better one now. I've got, <laughs> I've got at Made Man on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, but, uh, you know, Made Man was my attempt to do something new, but I also found impactful, but fun. Uh, you know, I've been doing crypto for six years. That was my life, working 80 to 100 hours a week with no break. Uh, by the end, uh, by the beginning or the middle of the bear market, if you consider us to be back in a bull market, um, you know, I was just pretty burnt out. My whole life had been crypto. The industry was increasingly experienced executives, Wall Street people, big governments. There's, you know, the way I like to put it is the industry matured faster than I did. And all of a sudden, you know, I had an investment fund, we were making investments. But as an entrepreneur, I saw less and less opportunities for a non-technical person such as myself to really make an impact. And so I started to think as my entrepreneurial itch came back, which it's always there, but doing venture and having a team with an entire investment process wasn't taking up you know, 80 hours of my week. It was taking barely 40. And so I knew I had the energy to start something new. I uh, was thinking about moving, ended up in Miami and decided to tackle a problem that I think exists for many men, um, and which is skin care. Half of all men don't take care of their skin, even though the more you learn about it, the more you realize, you know, brushing, uh, you, you know, uh, using moisturizer and taking care of your skin should be as common sense as brushing your teeth or using deodorant. And so I started building this skincare brand about a year and a half ago, but really working on it in earnest for the past year. And it's been the most fun I've ever had as an entrepreneur. Totally different. It's a direct-to-consumer, consumer, ca- consumer packaged goods brand, but very hands-on. Uh, I learned uh, creating distributed magazine how much I enjoyed having something that I could physically hold in my hands. I'm seeing if there are any bottles around there or not. But it's uh, mm-hmm. uh, but there's nothing better than creating something if you're not a, a coder and actually being able to hold it. It's so tangible. Like if you write code, it feels tang- tangible when the, the software works. But if you don't, if you're not a coder, being a software entrepreneur, there's something that's missing in the process because you, you, you while you're responsible for creating something, you don't feel like you create it. Whereas working with formulators and packagers and designers and then actually having the skincare product to hold I mean, there's no better feeling or even the magazine that I created. And so I've been having so much fun with that. We'll probably launch in like six months. Uh, we, we've got all the formulas finished. 
starting creating formulas is really complicated. Stability mm -hmm. testing causes all sorts of hiccups, but uh, I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, we've created something that makes skincare super easy. We've taken the five to six components of a skincare regimen that a man needs and packed it down to two products, an all-in-one moisturizer and a two-in-one shaving cream and facial cleanser. And I think we've got something that could be massive um, if we can get guys excited about and interested in skincare. So having a lot of fun with that, still involved in crypto land, still doing the investing, but it was a nice respite. Uh, mm -hmm. So really enjoying myself. So what's the go-to market for that? How do you convince men to d become more involved in their skincare habits? So it's multifaceted. Marketing is everything. So first of all, we've made it easy. Uh, stretch consumer, you just subscribe. It's a two month supply, uh, comes right to your door. So it's easy. It costs just more than a dollar a day. It's going to be around $85 for a two month supply for both products. Uh, so if you're not willing to invest a dollar a day into your skin, what the hell are you doing buying watches or cars or clothes? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, face is 60% of a first impression, but it's really about getting that message through. So it, uh, the, the two big parts are viral marketing obviously you think of something like dollar shave club or manscaped these brands do great viral marketing working with the best in the business for that and then partnering with really well respected men like professional football players skaters djs guys that happen to be in my network some that are not actors guys that men that are respected to that are seen as men that can have a conversation about skincare and and turn it more broadly into conversation about positive as opposed to toxic masculinity, investing in the self rather than superficial things. And then I've got a massive army of influencers, these young women with 10,000 to a few million followers that are all coming on doing a revenue share model with them. Uh, because these women, you know, they may have a million followers, something that's highly monetizable. Yet if you look at what they're selling on their Instagram, they're selling like yoga pants and skinny tees which makes absolutely no sense because if you look at their, uh, their follower demographics, it's anywhere from 70 to 90% men uh, who, if, if they're young men, are, are bigger spenders generally. You should be selling to your audience. And so these girls- Wow, that's big actually. Then think about that. Yeah, they're really excited. It's fun. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that right there is a hot tip yeah, for, any, no. for any, any entrepreneur who's trying to do marketing, advertising. Yeah. I mean, that's, so how do you find these influencers? Do you just go on, on IG? Do you go on different platforms, well, marketplaces? I, I, you've been to my house in Miami. Uh, I have, there's, 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 no, <laughs> there's no shortage of uh, young women in my life. Just, you know, you know, I was Bitcoin's party boy. I spent, you know, half a decade flying around the world, partying and doing crypto stuff. I met so many people. I met so many interesting influencer types, uh, both, uh, both on like, the male side of those like athletes, actors, DJs, all mostly from the crypto stuff. And then also uh, just the women as well, but then also having this great like kind of party house, the new crypto castle in Miami. Uh, you know, I, I, I know so many people that are connected to that world that it hasn't been hard. And then LA will make it a lot easier because I'm, I'm so tapped into the network there. Uh, but it, but, but it's, a, it's a process, you know getting them signed up, comfortable with what we're building, doing mm -hmm. photo shoots. Uh, you know, uh, it, 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 it's not easy, but I, I enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but I, 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 was de I was definitely well suited uh, uh, for something like this, you know, uh, because, because I'm, uh, I'm young enough to be approachable uh, and, you know, make it something fun that they do. So are you also creating a crypto villa or castle in LA? I, I think so. I mean, maybe I should call it the Made uh, Man Mansion. Made Man. <laughs> uh, no, I like I, that. You know, I, it, it, it honestly depends on who lives in the house. I've literally just started my search today. Turns out that LA is actually way cheaper than Miami, and uh, there's a lot. Oh, yeah. there, there's a lot we can do there, and so definitely going to do some sort of communal living with awesome entrepreneurs, as I've done in the past two cities I've lived in, and just create a, a, a great hub for. Crypto people, skincare people, I guess, uh, <laughs> entrepreneurs in general, because th these houses have provided so much to me. 
yes, it makes living in a dope mansion as cheap as living in a one bedroom apartment. Uh, but furthermore, it just, it, it causes this hive mind of interesting people to always be around me, to always be inspiring me, always finding people to collaborate with. I can't, I, I mean, I can't imagine living any other way in my 20s. All right. So we typically like to ask guests on the show three different questions. So not think of this as the lightning round. Yeah. So first question is, what are three books that have changed your life or inspired you? So I, 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 that's easy enough. Uh, so the first one I picked up in high school, it was Sunzo's Art of War, like a 40 page military treatise uh, from a couple thousand years ago. It's used by, it was used by Napoleon uh, back in the day, but it's used by uh, Asian business executives in the boardroom all the time. And it's the art of warfare, but really it's the way to think strategically. It inspired the college major I developed. Oh, this isn't lightning shit. All right, so Art of War, <laughs> Art of War, forget, forget about that. Art of War, uh, Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. That's part of what made me realize I needed to drop out of school. I just I had this intuitive sense when I found out about my credits that I knew right away I should drop out. Uh, then uh, most recently, I finished like three days ago. I actually spoke with the author today. Um, it's called the hypomanic, a the hypomanic edge. Uh, uh, how a little bit of cre crazy can lead to a lot of success, particularly in America. Uh, and it's about how people that are slightly manic, but not too manic, uh, mm -hmm. have driven most of the innovation and progress uh, in, in American history, starting from Columbus to folks like Alexander Hamilton to Thomas Edison. Uh, to Craig Venter, the creator of the, or the mapper of the human genome, uh, to someone like Elon Musk. And uh, it, w it gave me so much perspective on myself, but also just on how we got, oh man, this is not landing on. Uh, you got <laughs> how, what makes America so unique in a way, and more importantly, um, how being a little bit of crazy can really be a good thing. Wow, I'll, I'll definitely check that out. So it's called the hypomanic edge. Yeah. Sounds interesting. Yeah. Uh, all right. So next question: Who are three people outside your family and friends who have inspired you? Living or dead, or both? Both. Okay. Um, I'd say top three probably Benjamin Franklin, just like the ultimate polymath, revolutionary playboy, just. Just the most, <laughs> you know, it's so hard to find people in history that don't suffer from anachronisms, whether they were like slave owners or wife beaters. And like Benjamin Franklin was just like this fantastic, admirable guy that was so brilliant. And so he's, he's really one of my favorites. Um, Martin Luther King, from a very young age, I was just so inspired by his story, his ability to stand up to impression to turn the other cheek, uh, I definitely am one of my uh, greatest heroes. And then most recently would probably be Elon Musk. I, I think he's just so extraordinary. He's so willing to defy the odds and do what he wants and be, have fun while he's doing it. Uh, really just uh, a guy I look up to a lot. Well said, well said. All right, so last question. What are three actions you took that changed your life? Well, I mean, I, I, I named two of them, yeah. dropping out of school and going all in into crypto in 2015. Um, I think the most important thing that I've done, it's not a single action, but it, it's been my willingness to every time I get knocked down, every time I got kicked out of school or arrested or something didn't work out professionally, the ability, just my decision to always get back up. I, I, I reflect very quickly on what went wrong, try to learn my lesson, but don't, don't dwell on the past. So that, that's been massive for me. It's been totally necessary to my success. Uh, secondly, it's been my willingness to just defy what everyone else believes is the right decision. And, and that's one of the hardest things in the world, to do something that no one else really believes in, but to have conviction in yourself. Um, I've never regretted it. Once I've 
you know, once I've evaluated a decision, despite no one believing in me, I've always uh, been proud of, the, of making that decision in retrospect, whether it's going into crypto uh, or, you know, uh, going and uh, starting a skincare company. And then lastly, um, moving to Miami. I mean, God, it was exactly what I needed. Uh, I was so caught up in, in the crypto rabbit hole in Silicon Valley and separating myself from that and, and deciding to be more, become more introspective, to live life on my terms, to actually enjoy my 20s because I had the luxury of being able to do so was so good for, for me from a dispositional standpoint. Like I am so ready to like, be an adult and to grow up and to have like strong, meaningful relationships in a way that I wasn't prior to coming here. Well, that sounds great. All right, Jeremy. Well, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Where can people learn more about you? Twitter, uh, Disruptopreneur, Disrupt, and then the other part of Entrepreneur, uh, Gonzo Gardner on Instagram or gonzogardner.com. All right. Well, until next time, it was a pleasure. And as usual, the moon is not the limit to the moon and beyond. Thank you. Right on, man. Since the creation of the internet, every industry has been turned upside down. Amazon changed retail. Uber changed transportation. YouTube changed video forever. With the invention of crypto, money is next. At the speed technology is growing, the future of money and securities are digital. Nine out of 10 millennials do not trust banks. The value of money relies on trust. Government debt is higher than it's ever been before. Central banks continue to print money. Fortunately, the world has a new solution. Experts predict in seven years, 10% of the world's economy will be in crypto-based assets. Today, 1 billion people have access to the financial industry. Crypto is about empowering the other 6 billion people by banking the unbanked. Do not underestimate this. Do you wish you invested in Google, Amazon, or Netflix? before anyone ever knew about them? $1,000 invested in Netflix turned to over a half a million dollars. At Token Metrics, we help you find the next Netflix. Token Metrics users think differently about investing. They are early adopters looking for financial freedom. They are people who see a better world a world without international borders. We believe in a world where everyone has access to the next financial revolution. At Token Metrics, we are creating a bridge that gets you to that revolution. We will help you make sound investments in this new world. The world's best investors do not rely on their intuition. They embrace technology and AI to invest. Token Metrics uses AI to find invisible patterns in data to help you invest and trade in crypto. In the past, we have used our data-driven system to achieve financial freedom. Now, we are giving you the keys. We created Token Metrics to be the only platform you'll ever need to make money in crypto. We give you AI and access to crypto experts at the best price. The moon is not the limit to the moon and beyond. Disclaimer. Tokenmetrics Media LLC does not provide individually tailored investment advice and does not take a subscriber's or anyone's personal circumstance into consideration when discussing investments. 
nor is it registered as an investment advisor or broker-dealer in any jurisdiction. Information contained herein is not an offer or solicitation to buy, hold, or sell any security. The Tokenmetrics team has advised and invested in many blockchain companies. A complete list of their advisory roles and current holdings can be viewed here at tokenmetrics.com disclosures.